uh, for the translator, sorry about that. So you'll see here in the middle column that uh, the US and EU, the rich countries, so to speak, they're not doing so great in terms of their own budgeting and their own financing. They have limited funds. They are donating and providing foreign aid. You know what American people think is the amount of the federal budget going to foreign aid? They think it's 25%, completely wrong, less than 1%. So there's misconception politically, and in reality, there's not enough money for Europe in the United States to finance all the needs of the, uh, of the countries that are poor or struggling and trying to really advance. So that's a challenge. They all need to get their government credit ratings as high as they can. Finally, on the far right, you see where all the money is. It's with the asset owners, the sovereign wealth funds, the, um, the insurance companies, the um, asset owners. And they have 145 trillion with a T. That's where all the money is, right? And the question is, they're not gonna invest in these environments in Egypt, for example, much less Ukraine, unless they have investable opportunities. And that's what this is all about. We, can, we have to work at, as we heard earlier, at getting the enabling environment right, absolutely. I came here in 2009 or 10 with a Vietnamese delegation to learn about Irada. You remember that? The recent prime minister, Nguyen Xuan Phuc, I worked with him and a team, and they eventually re eliminated 500,000 regulations. Fantastic. That's an FDI-driven model for growth in Vietnam. They moved from the poorest country in the world in 1994 to where they were importing rice to the number one exporter of rice in the world. How did they do that? They got prices right. Peter Timmer, the ag economist, who Ali, one of my colleagues, Ali Kamal, sitting here, um, said, I took his course, Peter Timmer at Harvard. Get the prices right, get the market right. And you need that partnership between government and the private sector to get everything right so the market is for functioning. So this slide really tells you that we're not gonna get all the donor money that we need to finance the $3.1 trillion in gap funding every year to fill that gap. So how are we gonna do it? That's what this discussion is about. So blended finance, let's start with a definition. On the far left, on both of your screens, you'll see that Convergence, which is a trade association of all the blended finance organizations, companies, private investors, equity investors, and so forth, has this definition. Using capital from Catalytic capital is a term, a spark plug that starts the engine, right? Catalytic. From the public or philanthropic resources to incentivize and de-risk private capital for development. OECD has a similar, similar explanation. And you see the key concept that we have up here is leverage. USAID for many years has talked about global development alliances, working with the private sector, and it was a cost share model. So if a company, whoever it is, Pepsi, Coca-Cola, Nestle, if you put $1 million in, USAID will put $1 million, and we have $2 million to work with. What we're doing in West Africa, and what we need to be doing, and what blended finance enables, is one to five minimum for every one dollar of concessional public money, grant money, USAID grant money or philanthropic money. We need to get a minimum of five dollars and I think we can get $20. We have cases, Charles will share with you, that are 15 to 20 times $1. You begin to get the multipliers in the private capital and leveraging it and bringing it into the economy and all of the industries that have growth opportunities that becomes a multiplier effect in the economy. And then we're looking for impact, right, and returns. You can't just have social impact without a sustainable return on investment for the investors because they won't come into, our, into Egypt or any country, not the US, anywhere. They don't get those returns. And so what we're looking for is job creation. Every politician in the world, I don't care where they live, Tokyo, Washington, Cairo, needs to generate jobs and livelihoods or they're out of business eventually. The Vietnamese open their economy from a communist system, controlled pricing to a market system because they're gonna go out of business. They created jobs, they created livelihoods, they got the market working. 
So you have to create jobs and you have to create exports. You have to have a competitive economy. We heard a really good presentation earlier about export competitiveness drives your growth. The other thing, though, is on the bottom is the returns. You have to have the financial returns, as I said, for any of your investors to come in in the first place and to not just do it one time with de-risking tools that we use from catalytic capital, but for them to do it second, third, fourth, fifth time. So the multipliers and the sustainability is critical. Now, I ask myself, can we get more than this leverage of 20 to 1, 1 to 20? I'm talking to a company now based out of the United States, out of Kansas City, who was referred to me by a friend at the International Finance Corporation. And this company will do this year $130 billion in supply chain financing. 